Welcome to Dairy Robot Radio, the show that provides answers to your most pressing questions about dairy farming and automation. Each episode will focus on a major topic within the dairy industry and will feature experts throughout our industry and within Laylee to help provide information and different perspectives on automation. And now, here's your host, Bolana Putz. Welcome back, Dairy Robot Radio community. Here in the fourth week of Dairy Month, it is time to hear from another great dairy producer who is harvesting milk with Laylee Technology and is also bottling their own milk uh, for consumers to enjoy in the great state of Washington. As we take our tour across Canada the United States, today's special guest is Larry Stapp of Twin Brook Creamery. Larry, thanks for joining us. Tell the folks where you are located and a little bit about your farm. Well, good morning, Milana, and welcome to uh, the Pacific Northwest where we live via telephone. We are way up in the northwest corner of the state of Washington. Our dairy is located a half a mile from the Canadian border and about 10 miles from the Pacific Ocean. We're a very mild temperate climate here, and we just love living here. It is just the most gorgeous four-season uh, place to live on the face of the earth. We got mountains on one side, the ocean on the other. Um, we're just blessed in a beautiful area here. Sounds gorgeous. Um, tell us a little bit more about your farm. How many generations have been there at your site? Uh, thanks again for asking. It is a very proud thing for us here. I currently am fourth generation. Um, the dairy was established by my great grandfather in 1910. Um, our daughter and son-in-law, Mark and Michelle Tolsma, are full partners in the dairy with us, representing the fifth generation already to farm this land. And they have five, soon to have six, children, the oldest of which is 14 years old, heavily involved in all aspects of the dairy farm already, from cattle to uh, driving tractor to helping us in the bottling plant. Um, they just love being part of it. Nice. Uh, sounds like a typical dairy. It's always growing, the family and the herd size. But um, tell us more about your cows. What type of cows are you guys milking? We milk the Jersey breed of cows, uh, which compromises approximately 10% of the dairy herd in the United States. We used to be a Holstein producer. Uh, back in 1995, we switched from Holsteins to Jerseys. We have never looked back on that decision. We thoroughly enjoy them. One of the comments that always sticks in my mind uh, after we made the switch is, my wife says, when you look in their eyes, there's something there. And she just, just loves them. And people just fall in love with the little jerseys. I mean, the, the little babies, when they're born, they're like little fawns. Uh, the, the cows and calves all have the big black eyelashes and eyebrows and they just, yeah, they're just a beautiful animal. And of course, they're so curious, they just, when strangers come up, they just love to be uh, nosing and around and know what's going on, so. I don't know if people call dairy cows romantic, but they, they do uh, have some romantic qualities about them in those endearing eyes. But more importantly, they really put some good uh, milk in the tank for you guys. Um, how did you get started bottling and selling your own product? It started about um, 13 years ago. In 2006, our daughter and son-in-law asked if they could join into the dairy. And of course, you're always very enthusiastic when the next generation wants to participate because too many dairies, sad to say, are on their last generation. But in his, in his, my son-in-law's youth and enthusiasm, you know, he says, let's milk a thousand cows and let's, let's get big, you know, just like everybody else and let's go. And I said, you know, that would be a multi-million dollar expansion. Let's look at doing something different and adding value to our raw commodity. Let's see if we can market direct something, doing some direct marketing. With very little in for, uh, formal research, it was more just us prodding around and looking and asking. We just found nobody was doing milk and glass bottles. So we started that actually in 2007, a year after they became partners. Uh, we did not kind of realize what we were getting into. I always say ignorance is bliss when we started. 
but uh, it has just exploded into a, a wonderful market opportunity for us. And um, it has opened a lot of doors. It has connected us with customers. Uh, it's just been a, a wonderful, wonderful experience. Uh, it made me also truly appreciate what a cooperative does for dairies. You know, cooperatives oftentimes can't set the price. That's that's probably one of the one of the negatives. But my oh my, they take care of the marketing, they, which we now have to do. They take care of the balance, which we have to do. They take care of the collection, which we have to now do. So it kind of puts everything in perspective when you uh, when you stick your neck out on your own. So what what is it that you guys produce there? What are you selling to the consumer? We only sell fluid dairy products. Uh, we haven't got into any um, manufactured products yet. Uh, we do uh, all four uh, milks of whole, 2%, 1%, fat-free. We do a chocolate milk, we do a strawberry milk, and then we do a seasonal eggnog. And we also do a half and half and a heavy cream. Uh, of all the products that we do, probably my favorite is the heavy cream. Uh, we call it our liquid gold. It just surpasses anything out there that it's on the market. So where do people up there in northwestern uh, Washington state, what, where do they find it? Or are you beyond state borders? No, our little marketing geographic area at this time consists from the Canadian border all the way south down to Portland, Oregon. And then we're just on the western half of Washington State. Washington State is sort of split in half by a range of mountains called the Cascade Mountain Range. The west side where we live is a very temperate, mild climate. The east side is much colder and drier and hotter during the summer. So our little marketing area encompasses um, some of the highest density c cities in Washington State, uh, Seattle and its suburbs, uh, which is where probably 70% plus percent of our milk is sold. And what are some of the retail stores that people find your products at? Uh, there's a QFC, which is a uh, Kroger retail chain. There is a, a chain of, based out of Bellingham that goes all the way down to Olympia called Hagen. There is several independent chains in the Seattle area called Metropolitan Market. And then there's the town and country chain and then there's numerous independents, uh, the food co-ops, um, all said there's approximately, from the Canadian border down to Portland, about 200 uh, retail stores that you can uh, buy our products in. Fantastic. So why did you choose refillable glass bottles? Little did we know that that was probably going to be our biggest key marketing opportunity and access to grocery stores. We did it because we just noticed that there was somewhat of a demand for it and nobody else was doing it. What it has really given us is a unique product to market. The grocery stores absolutely um, fell in love with our product because it does two things for them. It gives them a local identifiable product. Now, I'm surrounded by um, a lot of dairies in western Washington here. They ship to a co-op, but co-op's milks are co-mingled, and the uh, co-op is farmer-owned, but you can't identify this farmer's milk and this bottle or whatever. This gives them an identifiable local product from one family. Then the other thing that it does is milk priced in grocery stores is not a high profit center item for them. Our glass milk bottles does not compete with the plastic jug milk. Our glass bottles does not compete with the carton milk. So it gives them an opportunity to promote a local product and actually make some money on it also. I sometimes kind of cringe how much they mark it up, but it's a win-win for both the retail grocery store and us as a dairy farm wholesaling it to them. So it's, we are welcomed into grocery stores oftentimes with, with open arms. When we first started bottling your milk, you're out there clawing and fighting for every store you can possibly get. But after about two years, 
we stopped calling stores because the stores started calling us faster than we could uh, fulfill their needs of uh, milk. And it just grew and grew and grew. Awesome. Yeah, it, you're, you, were, you were in front of the trend before local became cool again, it sounds like. Uh, we see that across the country, north and south of the Canadian border, uh, where consumers are really looking for that locally grown, really source verified product. So congratulations for having that foresight and continuing to provide that great, yummy, wholesome, tasty product. But for folks who have never seen a bottling facility or been to a creamery, what goes into producing a healthy product, you know, in terms of what you wear, or what your sanitation uh, SOPs are. What does that look like uh, to bottle a healthy product like that? Probably the first and foremost, most important thing is a high quality raw milk. You can't clean up dirty milk. You can scrub it a little, but you can't clean it up. So that's the foundation of quality milk. Then after you have the high quality milk, the, the whole processing of it uh, was a very huge eye opener for me. I mean, it, you had to transition your whole mindset from operating a dairy to operating a processing plant. And I was just absolutely amazed at what I did not know. But sanitation is just highest priority. I mean, when we would wash up a piece of equipment on a conventional dairy farm after you're done milking or using it or whatever, you you know you would take some warm water, rinse it, you rinse, wash it with soap, you usually have an acidified rinse and you're done. You have to probably quadruple that in a processing plant. And everything around it has to be clean. You have to think about air how much bacteria or dust is floating in the air. You have to keep your product totally confined. Once you start pasteurizing it, you basically do not want it exposed to air again so that uh, nothing can get in there. You've got to keep everything closed up. Um, it, it's, it's quite something. And then, of course, then the whole regulatory world that you have to abide by, which is all good and proper because they're looking out uh, for the safety of um, the general public, you have to log everything and log everything and log everything. So it, it is just completely beyond just operating a dairy farm with high quality milk. But as I said, the first and foremost thing is the foundation of it all is high quality raw. So how do you harvest that high quality milk? What, how, do you, how do you go from cow to glass on my table? Well, what's in between? Let, let me first quantify what you just asked. You cannot harvest milk. You have to allow the cow to give it to you. You cannot forcibly take milk from a cow. You can attach a cluster. You can attach, you know, vacuum and try to suck it out. But if she does not give it to you, you're not going to get it. Now, why do I say that? Because anybody that dairies when a cow is ready to be milked, she produces oxytocin, which allows the milk to be released from her udder and then taken or harvested. But until she releases it, you can't get it. You can go out to a field and you can harvest wheat, barley, corn. You can take it whenever you want, but you cannot take from a cow. Having said that, the most important thing for a cow when she is giving you that milk is a calm, quiet environment. They respond very, very much to the environment that they're in when they're being milked. If they start getting excited and, you know, things are nervous, uh, there's yelling going on or some other physical things going on, they start releasing a hormone called adrenaline instead of oxytocin, which is ex does exactly the opposite of what is needed to uh, take the milk that she would be normally given to you. Once that cow is given it to you, we then use the Lely Robotic uh, Milkers uh, to collect the milk uh, that she gives us. 
we always said prior to uh, putting these uh, robots in, which will be four years this summer that we have put them in, we thought we had gentle cows before. You know, they were pretty calm. We could walk through them. They never ran, you know, they just hung around. But when we put the robots in, the automated milkers, they became even calmer and more relaxed yet. It was quite a shock or an eye-opener to us. But if you stop and think about it, the cows prior to our automated milkers, our robotic milkers, they had to live around our schedule. We would go out to the barn twice a day, chase them all home from the pasture, or chase them all out of the stalls, clean the stalls, get them into a holding pen, and they had their wait their turn to go through the milking parlor to be milked. Now... They choose when they want to get milked. They choose when they want to get up. Whenever we walk out into the herd now, it is just to observe them. So they don't move out of your way. They even became more gentle and more relaxed after they uh, became accustomed to the robotic milkers, which took three, four months probably. But that has been probably one of our largest marketing um, uh tools also when we tell the consumer about that you know first their, their first thought is a robot milking a cow like that's some sort of you know bad thing for the cow you know they're not getting the human interaction but I always say this when a cow gets by, milked by an automated milker a robot lately in this case when the cow decides to kick when they decide to switch their tail or, for lack of a better word, crap all over you, when that happens to the automated or robotic milker, there is no retaliation. There is no emotions get involved. When that cow walks into that automated milker, that robotic milker, it is the same every time. They know they will never get hit back or yelled at or anything like that. And they love consistency and that has just been so reflected in our cow's well-being it's just it, it was it blew me away so what other you know benefits or lifestyle changes or what are some of the other benefits that you have that you are now experiencing there on the dairy farm as a result of changing to the Lely technology four years ago? Um, number one, we are one full employee less because of the automated milkers. The nice part of the automated milker, the robotic milkers, is they never have sick days. We don't have vacation days. We don't have to pay their unemployment insurance and all the rest of that kind of stuff. And we don't have to worry about them not showing up or being late or anything like that. Now, in the case of our dairy operation here, when we terminated our milker that was milking our cows, we had an opening in our processing plant, so he's still with us, and he's actually our longest employee here, been here 11 years already. Um, in terms of the owners, uh, myself and uh, my son and daughter-in-law, we don't have to worry about the condition or who's taking care of the cows while they're being milked and if they're not being milked out properly. Um, it's given us real peace of mind knowing it's been consistent. Um, we don't have to worry about, oh, the milker didn't show up today, who's gonna cover them, you know, things like that. It became a little bit more of an eight to five day, not that it's eight to five by any stretch of the imagination, but our day became a little, little more structured in the way we could utilize our time. It gave us more options, you might say, in that respect. Um, so that has been been a very, very nice benefit of it. The way, way we actually kind of do it too, and it's even been a bigger benefit for me, is if the Lely Robotics ever have a, uh, a malfunction, they, they give us a call on the phone, right? Well, they call my son-in-law twice first before they call me, so um, when, when he, when I finally do get the call, I either know he's sleeping or he's really busy. So, so that it's worked out really well in that respect.
Sounds like a sounds like peace of mind. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so you said you said two things there: uh, uh, differences that you've seen for the people, and differences that you've seen for the cows. And you've sh- you've shared a lot with us about the cows, but what else is on your mind when it comes to cow welfare and the differences that you've seen in your cows in these four years milking with the robots? Well, as part of our um, Lely um, equipment or robotic milker, uh, there's multiple things that it is monitoring now for us concerning their their health and their well-being. Number one, it's milk. It's weighing the milk as the cow's being milked. Number two, it's recording the butterfat content. Number three, it's recording the protein content. Number four, it's monitoring if she has any potential udder infections. The other thing that it's doing for us on the girls is it's monitoring uh, their footsteps. It's their pedometer or their Fitbit so that uh, we know how much or how little a cow's moving. And then it also records how many minutes a day she's chewing her cud. All those things are being monitored 24-7 on every cow. We don't care about all the cows that are following their basically their baselines or their averages. All we want to do is know about the cows that deviate from their averages, whether it's a drop in milk or, or an increase in the conductivity of the milk or reduction in uh, rumination or activity or, or an increase. And that thing will oftentimes give us indications of a health issue long before you can physically see it. So you can be much more proactive in taking care of a cow's health, such as a rumination. If you see a cow has a digestive upset, the first thing that you can do is you can uh, look at their rumination. I mean, and you can see it going on long before they're, they're, they're showing any physical signs. You right away give them a little yeast or some probiotics or something like that. Be much more proactive in, in their overall health. And it's just, it's been a, it's been a real win-win in that respect for our girls too. How does the robot work when it comes to your breeding rates um, and detecting estrus? Well, I'm 64 years old and I'm still a little bit old school and I like to see them in standing heat with my eyes. But my son-in-law, he's got much, much more in tune to that because he pretty much runs that and... Um, you know, he can detect those estruses off a report real quickly. He can make the determination whether it's a false heat or whatever. But there's two typical things that happen when a cow comes in heat. And it shows up just beautifully on a graph in that lady thing. Activity shoots off the charts in terms of uh, increase. And rumination dives. They're just too busy cruising around to chew their cut. And when you see those two lines intersect, you know you got a cow in heat. You don't even have to go look. Uh, you know, you just have to make the determination whether it's uh, soon enough to breed after calving or anything like that. So he watches that probably far more than I do um, in terms of uh, reproductive uh, health and stuff like that. So it's eased the time needed to do physical observation for heat detection because you can just walk into the, uh, the computer there, look at the screen, you know, two or three minutes after a little bit of analysis work, you can tell exactly who's in heat and you haven't even been out to the yard yet to look at the cows. Well, for those folks in the upper northwestern part of the United States who's traveling up and down the roads and looking for a local product, um, can you help describe what your logo looks like so that when they look on the in the milk case, what they should be looking for, Larry? A glass milk bottle with a picture of a beautiful Jersey cow's head in the front center of the bottle and the words Twinbrook Creamery on it. And it'd be pretty hard to miss. It's very eye-catching, very eye-catching. And they can look for uh, half and half, heavy cream, strawberry milk, white milk, of course eggnog during the holiday season, but as as we get ready for a blistering hot summer here of humidity here in the Midwest, Every, uh, everybody likes an ice cream cone or a milkshake to cool off with. And uh, you've brought, f- brought us a delicious looking recipe here um, called the Twin Brook Chocolate Moo Shake. <laughs> what are some of the ingredients in that, uh, Larry? What, 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 how do I make one of those? To be perfectly honest with you, our chocolate milk that we do produce 
out of our processing plant from the cow's milk. Most people will describe that to us as melted ice cream. So if you think about taking our chocolate milk and using it as in a milkshake, you've got the foundation ingredient of uh, chocolate milk, which tastes like melted ice cream. Yum. Can you tell our listeners what else goes into a Twinbrook chocolate moo shake? Uh, the other ingredients uh, for our, for our uh, moo shake are, uh, are, of course, our chocolate milk, uh, chocolate ice cream, and then chocolate syrup. So for all those chocolate-aholics out there, they will get a, uh, they will really enjoy that. You know, um, one other question I have for you is, what do, um, you know, if you run into a, a consumer of your product, what have they told you about your milk? Two things primarily is there's no aftertaste of container. That's one of the huge things of glass. But probably most importantly is people say they have never tasted milk that tastes so good. And I think, again, the foundation of that is because of the Jersey cow breed and the high quality milk that they produce. When we bottle Jersey milk, of course, which is not commonly bottled or uh, put into a, a milk container by uh, conventional dairy processing, they're missing the real taste of what milk used to be. It's so fun. My wife and I, we do a lot of store samplings. I mean, that's one of our marketing tools is we go into stores, set up for two, three, four hours and tell the story about our farm and give out samples. And people that have, have been raised on a farm that have drank raw milk all their lives because that's what they had, and then they will taste our whole milk that has been pasteurized. You ought to see the smiles and their eyes just roll in the back of their heads. The memories just flood them. They said, this brings back memories of the greatest tasting milk I had when I was a kid or when I lived on the farm. That is so gratifying. And the other part of it is too is we're not trying to cannibalize anybody else's milk sales. We're getting a lot of people back drinking milk who quit for one reason or another. Uh, maybe it was taste. Maybe it was because of issues of health. Uh, they had some side effect issues of, uh, of bloating or stuff like that. And so many people say, I cannot drink conventional milk, but I can drink your milk without the side effects. And that I had before and that is so gratifying getting people back drinking milk again I know we're just a small drop in the bucket of the total milk sales in the United States but every drop counts in my book so Larry do you have any fond memories of what consumers have told you after drinking Twin Brook Creamery milk there was this there was this young couple that lived in the Seattle area for a number of years and and they got hooked onto our crack of chocolate milk right so they moved to Florida, and the, the husband wanted to do something really special for his wife. So he called us up and he said, my wife misses your chocolate milk so bad. Is there any way you can ship me some? Well, when you ship a liquid product in a glass bottle with refrigerated ice packs around it, overnight air, you can imagine that it's pretty much impossible to do it cost effectively, right? So I said, if you want me to pursue it, I will sell you the two half gallons of milk or whatever you want, and you can send me a check for that, but you contact our local shipping company and pay the shipping charges directly yourself, and you can get the quote. So he immediately did that. We sent him two half gallons of chocolate milk wrapped in ice packs to Florida, I think we charged him $20 for the product. It costs him in excess of $200 to get it there. But he made his wife happy. I, I wish I lived closer so I could more easily get a sample of it. But for everybody out there in the Dairy Robot Radio community, uh, west of the Rockies, or heck, maybe you're going to go on vacation this summer out to the Seattle area, 
stop by one of those 200 different retail locations, the food co-ops, the independent grocers, and, and look for that great label Twinbrook Creamery on the shelves of your local grocer. Well, Larry, on behalf of all of us here at Laylee, we really appreciate your choice of putting those Lely robots um, in your barn four years ago and choosing to, uh, I guess, collect your milk as you, as you correct, uh, stated earlier, you really can't harvest milk because you can't drive a tractor down a row and choose the day and time that you want to. You, and, and how important that is for that oxytocin to let down to get that milk ready in a calm, quiet environment. So thank you so much and uh, we'll talk to you down the road, Larry. Well, thank you again for the opportunity and I can only wish Laylee and all uh, your employees and coworkers the very best. You've been listening to Dairy Robot Radio, the show for dairy producers who want their questions answered by experts in dairy automation. Connect with us at dairyrobotradio.com to listen to all episodes and learn more about the topics and guests on the show. You can also find us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify.